Hello and welcome to this special conversation with Sanjay Murdeshwar. He's the managing director of the Novartis Group of Companies in India. And he's going to be talking to us about a range of topics from the union budget that's just been presented to how COVID-19 has impacted the pharmaceutical business. Sanjay, thank you very much for making time for us. Thank you so much for having me. Really, yes. really appreciate it. You've been very appreciative of the union budget in its efforts to, uh, you know, sort of restore growth and a recovery of the economy. But you also said, and I'm going to quote, that we keenly anticipate an equal impetus on innovation and R&D policies attracting future investments in R&D and retaining world-class talent in the country is critical to make the country Atmanirbhar. What are the challenges that pharma companies face on both these fronts? Specifically on the research and development part, I think um, um, the Prime Minister, I think uh, in the last, uh, I think, few months, quarters, year, has really talked about Discover in India, mm -hmm. uh, which is a very important uh, philosophy and we fully, fully support it because I think India has all of the natural talent to ensure that we can go back into the value chain of discovery uh, of medicine because you can really... Um, make sure that you can create medicine, you can discover medicine for our population and disease areas. Of course, there are a couple of challenges we have. I think uh, a big challenge is discovery is a very long process yeah. of incubation. And so, high investment. And high investment with high risk. Mm -hmm. So around the world, uh, you can imagine that most countries, the government plays a very important part in discovery and funding of discovery. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, if the government could play a very important part in discovery and funding of discovery, that would be interesting. The U.S. is a great example yeah. where the NIH does a lot of basic discovery and then, of course, companies take it together and, you know, take next steps. So I think that's why if the government could do a little more in instigating that process. So I think that was, uh, that was a big uh, area. The other one is on talent. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, um, I think I remember um, reading it somewhere, if I'm not mistaken, there are approximately 15,000 PhDs in the U.S. every year, and in India, maybe around 2,000 PhDs for bio biochemistry. Mm -hmm. uh, now, that's a challenge. Yeah. You know, yeah. if you want to do discovery, you need super talented people. And even the 2,000 that you would have in India, many of them would actually head, you know, go out outside India. Absolutely, because the to funding really of discovery. really fulfilling uh, careers. Correct. So if we can mm -hmm. really invest mm -hmm. in institutions mm -hmm. that can have super talented uh, smart um, uh, PhDs or, mm. or just scientists who are interested in research along with the discovery investments in R&D, mm. uh, which the government can fund, I think that would be a great combination. With the illustration of the NIH, what could the Indian government do to fund R&D? Um, and, you know, what would the nature of those research-linked incentives that people talk about, how would that work? Personally, I think mm. incentive is one element, mm. but I think for me, discovery and research mm. is about talent mm. and the ecosystem that one can bring together mm. to discover, which is really a combination of three things. Academia, mm. really smart people. Mm. Mm. Number two, companies, corporations. And number three, venture capital and financing. Mm. Um, venture capital, private equity, or any type mm. of financing. So all three have to come together for that ecosystem to, to collaborate. You can see that in San Francisco, you can mm. see it in Boston, you can see it in Basel, you mm. know, where the yeah. institute. We can do that in India. So we have the Indian Institute of Science mm. in Bangalore, yeah. super smart people. Uh, I'm sure a lot of great work is happening there, but can we build an ecosystem mm. around it by which we can fund those institutions more mm. that they can really invest in long-term discovery projects. Right. Right, because as I said, incubation is long. It's not that RNA mm. uh, was just discovered for vaccines. Yeah, it yeah. was discovered maybe 15 years ago uh, as a tool, and now it has been applied. Used in this way, yeah, application. And the that... Applied in, in, in vaccine. Yeah. So can we do something there? Mm. Uh, I think, because as I said, mm. it's a long-term incubation mm. period. The second area which um, I'm a big believer of, you know, and I've always talked about it, that uh, discovery and research mm. is becoming a computing challenge. Mm. And India has massive talent in data, digital technology, smart computer scientists. So can we go and look at a very specific area of research where India can add value? Mm. Maybe for the short term, five, 10 years, because di discovery is a 20 year, 30 year agenda. Uh, so, and we have got talent there. We have got great companies. Um, so how can we all come together uh, and the government can help out 
to again tap a very specific area of this discovery mm -hmm. through what India currently has. I think 2020, early 2020, you all launched or inaugurated this bi the biome in Hyderabad. Yes. Give me a sense of how that works because that's very that's different from the drug development center that you also have in Hyderabad. And I uh, I'm wondering if biome was uh, you know Novartis's. Um, individual effort in the direction that you just outlined? Absolutely. Um, I think there are three basic areas of where mm. technology uh, can move. One is uh, we innovate. Mm. Um, the second is the way we engage with our customers. Mm. Um, and third is how can we operate or you know really have efficient operations. So all three are important parts of the value chain of a pharmaceutical company mm. or any medicines research company like us who reimagines medicine. Mm. So what we are very humble in understanding is that we cannot do everything. Uh, but mm. there are a number of startups in India who have got great talent. Uh, there are a number of academic institutions who have great talent and are doing great things. Mm. So can they be an extended partner of ours mm. who can you know, work with us and be an extended part of our world class teams to do exactly what we want to do is solve problems in mm. discovery maybe solve problems in how do we reach as many patients as possible right. um, faster uh, or how can we have efficient uh, operations mm. uh, and that's the idea that we can create a, a platform mm. which all of these startups can be part of our extended internal work teams mm. uh, so and we have this around the world mm. so we have uh, uh, is the uh, india one was the first one in asia by mm. the way you launched the biome in hyderabad just a month before the pandemic came and upended our world, uh, what has the experience been like and what kind of work has happened out of there? Um, you know, very interestingly, everything got accelerated. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Um, I think Novartis had already mm. begun, if I may call mm. a journey of getting into becoming more of a data and digital mm. company, mm. discovering medicines. I mean, that's really what we want mm. to do. Mm. Around two and a half years before the pandemic, mm. So we thought it's going to take another four or five years for us to get all of our technology uses of different digital tools, mm -hmm. you know, to do whatever we want to do. But obviously the pandemic just accelerated everything. I'll give you a, a good example of that. Um, a number of times uh, what was at the biome is there are a number of startups mm -hmm. which will provide great uh, technologies uh, for, uh, for measuring uh, for wearables, mm. for example. Mm. Um, I think at this moment, our startups in a biome in Hyderabad could work with those startups very, very quickly. Mm. People did not have to be convinced on wearing wearables because mm. people were already in the mode of digitization. Mm. Mm. So suddenly, uh, we went down that path and you know tried to work with a number of startups where we can have better um, understanding of diagnostics, home diagnostics, yes. Yes. Uh, you know, for the eye, of a heart failure, and so on and so forth. So that actually got accelerated. Mm. Uh, because so that, of COVID. Because of COVID, definitely. Because people, mm. that barrier which was there, yeah. of what is there on the other side to take that leap, mm. Mm. became much, much, much lower. Um, mm. We all know that, you know, suddenly the four, by, whatever, the seven by eight screen yeah. became our world. Yes. And we are very comfortable with it. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, adoption, you, you're saying, was huge. accelerated. Adoption mm. was accelerated and, you know, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy mm. sometimes. You adopt and therefore mm. you discover more. Mm. And therefore the acceleration happens. Right. I'll give you another area of discovery. Um, so we have in India or around the world, mm. we have uh, uh, clinical trials that we do, uh, phase two, phase three clinical trials. Uh, and all of these clinical trials are done at sites around the world. Mm. In India, we have approximately uh, what, 370 odd sites around the country mm. where we do clinical trials. Mm. Now, somebody needs to monitor those sites. Somebody yeah. needs to make sure that the data is done correctly because you are mm. doing clinical data mm. testing. Mm. Now, how do we do it when people cannot travel? How do we ensure the mm. integrity of those trial data is mm. excellent? Mm. Now, this is where technology comes into play, where earlier maybe a monitor, a clinical monitor from Novartis mm. would go to that side, just check if everything is right, wrong. Now, technology enabled us to very quickly leap there, monitor the quality of data, monitor the clinical uh, um, standards there, mm. so that um, it accelerated our process. And now we are not going back. 
Right. It's changed mm -hmm. the way these this will be conducted for absolutely, good. absolutely. How you right. consolidate mm -hmm. data around the mm -hmm. world. Uh, earlier, it would be a different process. Now you have maybe 500 sites around the world. Mm -hmm. Data is coming much faster. Mm -hmm. Since COVID-19 came in, uh, we saw the medical ecosystem, right, from companies, vaccine manufacturers, labs, you know, diagnostic centers, the government, regulatory bodies. Like, there's been so much information about the working of the entire ecosystem. Uh, from your vantage point, uh, how would you say... Uh, this will change, uh, you know, the way the Indian ecosystem works. I think the biggest awareness is the importance of health in our lives. Mm. You know, people understand mm. that the importance of health and I think they understand a little more about medicines. Mm. Um, I think, um, as I said, my 78-year-old uh, mm. mother mm. is not talking about phase 3 clinical trials and asks me about it, yeah, mm. which... I think is an interesting conversation yeah. on its own. Yeah. Uh, but mm. if they can do it, so mm. people are a little more interested in understanding, okay, what's all these medicines about? Mm. Uh, everybody un try to understand how vaccines are developed. Uh, okay, does this have a phase three mm. trial? Oh, mm. this got an emergency authorization. Yeah. Oh, DCGI is doing yeah. it. Oh, they have to look at clinical trials to do that. Suddenly the public, uh, which is I think the good part, mm. uh, understand a little more about um, this, if I may say, a little more opaque world which yes, was there yes. of medicine. And a complex world, you know, you, you, and, uh, it's specialized knowledge and you feel you need specialized skills to be able to access that knowledge. Yes, uh, and mm. they appreciate that it's a highly regulated industry mm. uh, for good reason, yeah. right? Because finally we are mm. treating patients at the end of the mm. day. Um, I think so that is really from a population perspective. Mm. I think the government, I believe, um, certainly has also had huge uh, interest in healthcare. Mm. Um, I mean, just having the yes. COVID app, yes. getting vaccines available, um, I think it's become important. I believe around six months ago, they invested in rural mm. uh, infrastructure for healthcare. So mm. I think the government also understands uh, mm. very clearly that if you can g give great healthcare mm. to people, it's, it's good, <laughs> it's good for the population. Mm. Mm. Um, and third, from an ecosystem perspective, a lot of laws came into play where things will change, mm. i.e. telemedicine. Mm. Um, supply chains are changing, mm. right? There's e-pharmacies coming up. Mm. Uh, people are you know, looking, watching TV and yeah. understanding different platforms on how delivery of medicine can be done. So a lot of the entire value chain on mm. how big people are getting aware of diseases, how diagnostics mm. are done how treatment is done, mm. I think is becoming simpler, right. which is, I think, fantastic. Recently, we saw Denmark and, uh, you know, say that, okay, it's no longer a pandemic, it's an endemic, or at least that's the way they are going to deal with it. That seems to be the thinking in Europe. Uh, from your point of view, your perspective, your perch, where do you see uh, the COVID-19 pandemic in its sort of life cycle, if I can use that term, um, given that the Omicron wave seems to be receding in India at this point of time. I'm not a virologist or a scientist <laughs> no, by, I'm, you know, I, by yeah, any yeah, stretch of imagination. Of uh, but I think the way um, mm. I, we would, I think I would look at it is, um, I think people are getting, mm. whatever the type of disease, people are understanding how to deal with it. Mm. Mm. And I think that's important. It's the disease has changed or may evolve, but the people have understood how to deal with it mm. on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. We took a little more time last year, Omicron, we got a little more comfortable, mm. maybe the next year we get a little more comfortable mm. and so on and so forth. So the way we are reacting to a situation, um, I think is be getting better because of information, yeah, technology. Of so I think um, um, hopefully, I think in the very near future, we'll know how to respond to it just mm. like a regular flu. Novartis is not in the vaccines business anymore, though you used to be a few years ago, like you were telling me earlier. Um, but you have a COVID drug that's in the pipeline, or it's not in the pipeline, actually, it's available and seeking emergency authorization, I believe. Uh, what can you tell us about that? And is that something that it will happen in India as well? Um, I think we are very excited about it. Um, I think the, uh, the the drug that we have, uh, we, we we looked at very good phase mm. two data, mm. uh, and of course we still need to complete uh, you know all of the phase three mm. uh, clinical. So our focus is now to ensure uh, on three things. Number one is to really have a very robust phase three mm. clinical program. Mm -hmm. uh, number two is to ensure 
uh, how can we work with the regulatory bodies mm -hmm. in Europe and the US um, to get emergency authorization. And hopefully we can also have the same conversation mm -hmm. in India. Uh, you know, can we also do, uh, do so in India too? And, um, and that's the intent. Uh, the intent is um, uh, mm -hmm. how can we get the drug as soon as possible mm -hmm. to as many patients as possible around the world and not just, um, I think, in the, in the so-called developed countries. Sure. And we hope to work with the government. We'll, mm -hmm. Whenever we get the dossiers mm -hmm. and information, we'll certainly have conversations and we'll see where with it goes. With the regulatory authorities. Absolutely. Here. So much of the attention on COVID-19 for obvious reasons has deflected not just attention, but access um, to the treatments, medicine and attention that you need, you know, for other diseases, non-communicable diseases, um, conditions which are, um, which really debilitate life. You want to talk a little bit about that and, uh, you know, what are the learnings on that front? Or what is the, actually, what, are the, what's, what has been the experience mm -hmm. on that count? Uh, I think that's such a great question because I think that's one of the unsaid dialogues which has not really happened. Mm. And I think it should happen very, very fast. I'll give you a good example of that. Uh, on an annual basis in India, there are approximately... I think 600,000 transplants that took place, that take place before COVID. You know, in the year 2020... Transplants across organs. I mean... Across organs, yeah, kidney, okay. liver, sure. or whatever. Around 600,000 mm. or so, mm. I think, the data which I understand. Mm. In 2020, just 39,000 transplants took place. My God, that's like a massive drop. Absolutely. On an annual basis, we have a million uh, people in India having, uh, you know, having cancer. You know, um, if you don't detect it fast enough, they don't come to the mm. hospital fast enough, then you quickly go from phase one to phase two to phase three. Mm. Mm. Uh, or uh, heart failure, you know, there are eight million heart failure patients in India, eight million. And mm. heart failure mm. is a debilitating condition. You, heart failure, you have to be admitted into the hospital mm. because you basically yeah. stop breathing. Your, uh, your ejection fraction goes down. Well, a lot of these patients mm. could not go to the hospital. So mm. we do not know all of the mm. other mortalities that possibly would have or could have uh, mm. taken place. Um, so I think uh, or um, procedures like glaucoma yeah. or procedures of these kinds or uh, wet AMD mm. or, you know, mm. all of these procedures that had to be taken place, had to, that had to take place were all postponed. Mm. Um, so I think we will know in the short to medium term in the next couple of years the real, real impact. Uh, uh, health impact yeah. of all of that. Um, the learning, um, there have been learnings, but I think the f big element for us is um, you know, something that we are trying to do in mm -hmm. Novartis quite a bit is how do we perform for the short term, but we need to transform for the long term. Mm. And I think we as a society also need to understand that there are going to be these emergencies uh, yeah. that are going to come through. Uh, maybe there's going to be a next wave. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, mm -hmm. whatever happens. And we have to deal with it. But we need as a society, as mm -hmm. an e healthcare ecosystem, need to have a parallel system by which we do not... Um, uh, neglect everything the else yeah. big the yeah. big majority stuff which is happening yeah. i mean 8 million heart failure patients is mm. quite a bit mm. 600000 transplants is quite a bit yeah. and i'm just talking about two specific diseases there are 500 such other diseases that have so many patients especially in a country like us, like us. right yeah. novartis uh, has had a long history in india uh, what is your assessment of the way the pharma industry has progressed in the past 75 years because uh, we know about the generic story but what next i think the next wave of science is going to be very interesting um, i think uh, it's really going to be about uh, biologics is going to be in the area of cell and gene. Let me try to mm. explain a little about that. Uh, for a very long time, you know, when aspirin was invented, maybe I think in 1899, um, till I think till the 80s or 90s, a lot of medicine was actually a chemical compound. Mm. It was a chemical compound trying to solve uh, a disease problem. I think more and more, um, a lot of research and work has been, been done in the area of biologics, mm. of invention, uh, where uh, basically what you're trying to do is uh, take um, uh, a small slit of a, 
of a human or an animal organ and then develop it into some type of a, of a treatment um, uh, to solve a protein problem, an immune system problem. Um, actually, an RNA is a lot like that, which mm. we use in vaccines, mm. but you can use it in diabetes, sure. in heart, cancer, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, which is brilliant because you are going absolutely specifically to a very targeted therapy mm. with very light, uh, with mm. huge, uh, less amount of side, side effects. effects. So that's number one. Number two, uh, which Novartis we are very proud mm. of is in the area of mm. cell and gene therapy. Mm. Uh, again, going back to fundamental research in, in, in understanding, you know, how we can work with our with the genes um, or with the cells of our body uh, so that we can find a treatment for various debilitating conditions. Now, this is very fascinating because uh, nobody believes when I say this, but there are 10,000 mm. diseases in the world. Mm. But actually, we have so far only found cures for just 500. Mm. Mm. There are 20,000 proteins in the body. There are just 3% of the proteins even discovered, yeah. right? And there are millions of cells, but hardly 60% really have some type of transcriptome. So you really have all of these opportunities mm. using technology and discovery um, to totally change the face of how we can uh, treat uh, as many patients as possible, but more importantly, uh, very complex uh, unmet needs, which frankly do not have solutions. Good example will be neurology. Alzheimer's, mm. Parkinson's, um, mm. and uh, we hope all of these new technologies, the new ideas can move in that direction. So we're very proud of that. Uh, we are at the cutting edge and hopefully we'll find great solutions. Sanjay, we wish you all the very best. We hope all of those solutions come out as soon as possible and for the better of humankind. Um, wish you and the entire team at Novartis a lot of good luck. Thank you for talking to us. Thank you so much. All 10,500 of us, thank you. Thank you. And thank you very much for watching. Do tune in for conversations like this on Conversations on CNBC TV 18.